You're listening to the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast on the Waypoint Podcast Network. This week's episode is all about conservation. We're going to be talking to some local Delta and Ducks Unlimited leaders. And if you stick around to the end, we're going to be talking to you a little bit about the Goose Games, which is Delta Waterfowl is putting on a goose hunting tournament down in Wichita, Kansas. This episode is brought to you by Hunt Hickory Creek down in southeast and central Kansas. It's also brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries and Toe Tags LLC. Welcome to the Foul Front Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where our goal is to recruit and educate new hunters while entertaining the rest of you. Without new hunters and the mentorship of those more seasoned, this passion as we know it faces an uncertain future. So get the word out, turn the volume up, and enjoy the show, because you're on the Foul Front. All right. Well, today I've got uh, my friend Dave Casper, and Dave is the what do you call yourself, uh, the head of the uh, local DU chapter here? I'm the local area chairman for the Manhattan, Kansas chapter, and uh, I, I also do the state newsletter. Okay. So I'm the editor of the state newsletter for Kansas, and then that gets me a spot on the uh, state council. Okay. So I'm a board member, I guess, as well. Awesome. And so how long have you been, um, how long have you been duck hunting? Duck hunting, let's see. Um, I didn't start early. I probably started uh, 25 years ago, I guess. Do you remember what was your first hunt, your duck, your first duck hunt, I should say? Oh yeah, we used to jump ponds in high school, but we didn't, that wasn't duck hunting, as I later found out. Um, I didn't actually sit under some decoys until some guys uh, that I didn't even know contacted me about restarting the Manhattan, Kansas chapter after it had kind of died for several years. Um, and once I got to know them, they uh, invited me out on a duck hunt. And we actually, my first hunt was in Fancy Fancy Creek Bowl on Tuttle Creek okay. at the North End. And uh, I was uh, hooked immediately. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is great. Ducks yeah. come to you and you don't have to go to the ducks or chase <laughs> the pheasants. They're <laughs> right. You know, right here. They're just bombing in hundreds at a time. It was great. Do you remember, uh, what year was that? Hmm, that's a good question. That would have been, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, don't 25 know. years ago, I 25 guess. 25 years ago, whatever that, <laughs> whatever that equates to. Um, and what was your first, do you remember the first duck that you killed? I think we were teal hunting that, that, uh, first hunt. I think we all shot limits of teal in that little puddle right off the Fancy Creek Bridge there. Okay. And now, um, you had you been exposed to other hunting before that? Oh yeah, I grew up hunting uh, upland birds and deer, whitetails, uh, with some buddies, high school buddies. Um, yeah. But I really, like I said, other than jumping a pond, killing a few mallards in the fall, I uh, had never duck hunted per se with decoys. And, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for some reason, that really flipped my switch after I realized uh, <laughs> how how fun that was. So right, right. So, um, you know, kind of an interesting, something you said there, they had contacted you about, you know, starting up a, the local DU chapter, mm-hmm. so it was DU before Ducks almost. It was, and I think I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I knew I wanted a duck hunt, didn't know anything about it, didn't know anybody who did it, and uh, I met a guy whose uh, wife was friends with mine in college, and he, uh, we talked for a bit at an event, and he called me a week later and said hey we're starting up this du chapter and i said hey this is my chance to meet some guys who duck hunt right and um that's what it turned into it uh it was a great experience there were a lot of good guys involved in that chapter who are still around and and still participate and when they can but uh we've all grown a lot older in the last 25 years and raised families and and uh kind of moved on some of us have moved on um but i've I wasn't the chairman initially. I became the chairman about three or four years into it. Actually, uh, was awarded the uh, Area Chairman of the Year Award. Oh, geez. Which is the state's top award for a volunteer. Right. And uh, I can't really take all the credit for that because the guys who had the job, the position before me, really built the chapter. We all did. But um, there was we had some good leadership, and uh, it really took off. We had some great events. And uh, then I chaired it for two or three years, and... And moved on, and then it kind of fell apart again. And uh, they were looking for somebody who would pick it back up. And so I've been doing it ever since, probably for the last fifteen years at least. Nice, nice. 
Nice. So, um, you know, kind of, do you remember your first five years um, of duck hunting? You know, what were some of the, you know, styles and, like, things that you really picked up that you remember from that first five years? Oh, uh, wow. Well, um, yeah, we, when I started duck hunting, there were no mojos. There was no motion in the spread. Um, we were we were hunting over junky, plastic, cheap, oversized mallard decoys that we got or found or um, nothing fancy. Um, we, we could call. Everybody that I hunted with, and I didn't know how to blow a call when I met these guys, but they all did, and uh, that was something that took me a few years to pick up, and uh, that was that was the key in those days. If you couldn't call, um, you didn't have any motion in your spread, you were looking pretty sad most of the time, yeah. and uh, we still killed limits of ducks, but I don't feel like we killed the quantity of ducks that you can kill nowadays with the... With the uh, movement and the shakers and and uh, the spinners and, and everything that goes with it uh it's just it, it's changed a lot in my opinion for yeah. the better i think it i think it's attracted birds closer to the decoys and that allows the hunters to kill them more cleanly you're not losing as many cripples um i know some states originally didn't didn't allow that spinning wing decoy and uh do you remember the, the first spinning wing decoy that you saw oh yeah and uh honestly when they when uh actually the regional director who who then became a good friend of mine at the time here in in our part of the state uh he had the first uh spinning wing decoy that i saw or hunted over mm -hmm. and uh that was an amazing uh that was an eye opening <laughs> moment because the ducks came from the stratosphere and they sucked <laughs> right into that baby they didn't circle they just came in bam um, I thought this is the greatest thing that since sliced bread. And uh, what did, what did it look like? Uh, it was a horrible looking beast. Uh, <laughs> we called them the Slow Joe because it didn't really spin fast. Yeah. I don't remember what brand that was, but it wasn't a Mojo brand decoy. I think it was a Flambeau. And uh, once we found the the actual Mojo with the with the wing beak that made sense to the ducks, that that was even more effective. But the Slow Joe, as we called it, was effective. More so than having no movement at all. Right. So, you know, after having hunted this area for, you know, 25 years, what are some of the principal differences that you've seen um, in hunters, hunting, the actual, you know, flyway itself? You know, what's, what are some of the, you know? Uh, the flyway, uh, it's, for the most part, has, has not really changed a lot, although there there have been so many drought slash opposite flood years um we've had over the last 25 years some really great duck populations here because of the conditions mostly all weather related mm -hmm. and we've had some really lean years where the reservoirs were really low the marshes were weren't being pumped um s stuff just didn't happen but um for the most part i i, I think the biggest impact that I've seen was when um, the uh, uh, the the guys on TV. Um, who am I trying to think of? Uh, oh, like Heartland uh, or no? Prior to that, uh, uh, bearded, uh, Duck Dynasty. The Duck Dynasty. Yeah, trend. there you go, Duck Dynasty. When, when my daughter was younger in middle school, and Duck Dynasty came on TV, mm -hmm. it was, it had, it impacted so many of the younger kids of that generation, not only with their humor, but I watched their shows prior to their... The Duckmen? The Duckmen shows, yeah. because they had great footage of ducks being killed, which wasn't easy, it's not easy to do as a photographer and a video guy sometimes. Yeah. Um, getting good video of, of duck hunts is, I would say, damn tough compared to even, even a lot of the other hunts, outside of maybe upland birds. Right. But uh, they did a great job, and their show was really good. And then they went to Duck Dynasty, and it was humor. But that brought in to the fold a whole ton of uh, young kids who just wanted to emulate that that whole uh, air that they had about them. And uh, even my daughter got into it. I was encouraging her because... Yeah. At first, I thought this is crazy. It's really going to impact the number of people hunting yeah. my spots. 
and it did to some degree, but really the the backbone of what we do is young people and getting more people involved in hunting and and with today's regulations not 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 necessarily regulations but thought processes on guns and uh, um, the outdoors it, it's tough to get people um, at a young age to get involved and yeah. that show did a lot I think for for converting a lot of people into duck hunters or it's, at least they thought they were duck hunters. Yeah. Did, now, did you did you see like a market increase after that? Like the very next season, where you're like, oh, there's a lot more dudes at the ramp. I felt like, yeah, I, I felt like uh, maybe not instantly, but over the next few years, as the show really picked up speed, uh, it it was obvious that we had a lot more college kids out on the out on the marshes. We had a lot more kids in the field, a lot more people interested, a lot more uh, attendees at our ducks uh, events, our, yeah. our DU events, picked up speed. For the same reason, they all wanted to be a part of it. They they wanted to. We tried to buy up um, what we could that had Duck Dynasty yeah. stuff on it in those early years and uh, sold like crazy. It, I mean, if we could get size teacup, uh, we'd we'd sell that sucker for twenty five thirty bucks. You know, oh, man. back before everybody had one, it right? Was, it was super popular. So yeah, um, you know, it's you know, it's such a catch twenty two on you know want more hunters, want more hunters. But then, you know, it always hurts a little bit. Yeah, to... it, it, it's a little bit of a sting when you're uh, out there with 20 or 25 other guys in the marsh when you used to have only six or eight, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities here. Yeah, I think and, uh, one thing around here, there was, a, you know, there was that one spot that I had is I almost, uh, you know, knew I was going to have a bad day if I didn't see another truck mm-hmm. uh, when I pulled up into the parking lot because... Uh, the the area that I needed to hunt it needed like two other groups on it to right. keep the birds moving and right. you know otherwise they'd just set down right you know and that's and what, what, so <laughs> we, I've experienced that a lot if you're the only guy in the, in the marsh and the ducks are already there and they they are already established in that area you can't chase them out of there uh, with just one group one party you right. really need you really need some guys to stir them up now uh, one interesting hunting style that I know that you and me have talked about a little bit is uh, I guess, what do you call it? The, not, you didn't, I wouldn't call it the sleeping in method, <laughs> but, uh, go ahead, ex- explain, uh, kind of, uh, your style of hunting there for a while. I, it wasn't out of, uh, laziness. It was out of, uh, uh, more out of, uh, uh, being, uh, restricted by my family life. Uh, my wife took a position after I left a position, uh, at which, which, uh, Left left me as Mr. Mom basically for several years when our, when our kids were young and uh, uh, she traveled so I had to uh, get the kids off to school that was my job um, and at first I, I didn't think it was a great job but as it turned out I had a little more flexibility than most and so as my daughter would gladly uh, tell you uh, she regretted those days when I would uh, take her to grade school with uh, my 16 foot go devil duck boat in tow behind the the uh, SUV and drop her off in front of the school um, with my camouflage on and I didn't have my face paint or anything on but uh, I, and in those days it wasn't even a big deal to to, to bring a gun on on the campus you know so much oh, yeah, as it is now uh, but I had a shotgun and all my ammo in the back and everybody at school knew who I was I was just another mom dropping the kids off you know right. except I was the guy with the camouflage on in the duck boat in tow, and and uh, and I'm the one that took up all the space in the driveway while I was trying to drop my daughter off because my boat was so long. But uh, that got me out to the marsh late, and honestly, uh, late season when the mallards were coming back, it didn't really affect my uh, numbers at all. A lot of guys would be leaving at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and I'd just be getting started, and uh, a lot of those mallards would come back from feeding at long distances to settle back in and roost in the marsh. And right. I'd smoke uh, limited ducks in a half an hour, 45 minutes, and still be home by noon. Yeah. Some days. So, yeah, laughing. still going out on public land. Um, you yep, know, it was all what, public. Was there a little bit of, like, okay, I see there's, you know, there's three trucks here. Um, like, how, do, how did you, like, select your spot at that point when, you know, you're kind of getting second, not second picks, but... I was uh, fortunate in that uh, the spots I hunted were uh, out of the way. I'd use my boat to get... I would go uh, uh, upriver versus downriver a lot of times. I would I would get 
I would I would look for a remote spot where there I knew guys wouldn't walk to. I would motor to and then walk in a lot of times. Um, so I'd still carry my stuff. I'd carry a lighter load maybe, but I'd get as far away from everybody as I could. And so I wasn't mainly so that I'd have a little bit of space, but I didn't want to walk in on somebody in the daylight and screw them up either. Right. It wasn't really always easy to find a spot at nine o'clock in the morning. Sure. When you can't see everybody, their, their headlights aren't on. You can't tell where they're at. Right. If there's no shooting going on, you end up setting up too close to somebody. I, I hate it when people do that to me. And yeah, I knew I didn't want to do that to other guys. So they got there first. They'd already staked their claim and I'd uh, fill in wherever there was a hole. Right. <laughs> awesome. And now you also do a little bit of uh, photography, uh, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. So <clears throat> what, uh, you know, when you're setting up for a hunt, uh, is that something that you're ever, are you, you always shooting the camera or you just sometimes like? Um, it's mostly a sometimes deal. And a lot of times it's late season or uh, even that January week or after the split. Mm-hmm. Um, when I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be the only one in, around and I can always get my ducks killed first. I, I can't sh pull the trigger on the camera until I have all my ducks in, in a pile. Um, I'm a hunter first and a photographer second. Um, but, uh, I, I like to take my camera out on really clear, sunny days. Um, I don't have a great lens and uh, um, shutter speed's important on those on those birds coming in, trying to stop that motion. And so I set up on those days specifically to orient myself with the, especially if I can get a day when there's an east wind and I can get the sun at my back and the ducks coming in my face. Right. Which is uh, always a great day to hunt, but it's also the best way to photograph ducks to get um, them them looking into the to the shadows and right. you having all that sun on those wings they, they you can really stop the action and get some great picks sometimes when they're when they want to be where you're at and they jump right. right in it makes makes it a little easier right now um, are there any differences that you've seen um, you know as retaking over like the chairman of the du um, so how does that change like your thought processing, your hunting uh, while you're out there. Um, just, you know, <laughs> being a volunteer for DU and, and all that other. Um, uh, it, uh, I, like to, I, I like to think that um, a lot of those guys are supporting DU. A lot of them have window stickers in their trucks that are parked at the ramp. But I also utilize that as a place to advertise. We've, we've taken uh, little note cards with our banquet info on it and stuck it under everybody's windshield. Actually, one year I took tickets and stuck it under everybody's windshield with the event date on there and uh, tried to tried to promote our, you know, trying to get them to give back to Ducks Unlimited. Obviously, that resource is supported by DU pretty pretty heavily. Yeah. And uh, not that Wildlife and Parks and Fish and Wildlife don't do their part, but Ducks Unlimited does a, a lot to support uh, Ducks populations all over North America as well as in Kansas and, and a lot of these marshes we hunt uh, have been built and designed by Ducks Unlimited and then hand back, handed back over to uh, Wildlife and Parks and and nowadays they put up a lot of signs and Karens and stuff to, to uh, promote that process and that the the fact that they've done that but in the old days they're, they're, they just did it and walked away from it and left wildlife and parks to, to manage it. And right. They don't get the credit that, that from those product projects that they do nowadays. Yeah, yeah. And uh, hopefully all those guys that are out there hunting uh, realize that. What would you say to, uh, so there's a guy out there that he's, you know, he's looking at his DU chapter and it's kind of, you know, not very big or, you know, he like thinks, okay, I really kind of want to step up and maybe, maybe I'm going to shoulder the burden of, you know, Helping this DU chapter mm -hmm. out. What what do you what advice do you give um, to that person? Um, good luck. <laughs> it's <laughs> tough. It's tough to manage volunteers, um, and and I know the regional directors, uh, all three of them in Kansas fairly well since I work with them a lot on the newsletter and stuff. And 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 it's really difficult to. Um, 
motivate people who aren't already motivated by either DU or duck hunting to, to help out to help out and pitch in. Uh, I mean, there's very little incentive other than a free hat uh, and, and maybe an occasional uh, a deal at an event. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, for the most part, you're you're asking a volunteer to donate his time and his effort with really no return other than the fact that he gets a little bit of uh, self-satisfaction from hopefully raising some money and helping out helping out DU and which is a great cause I mean it really it really is a fantastic organization science-based organization that's all about the ducks yeah so have you found anything in particular like that you know you've had some up years you've had some down years and uh, things of that nature yeah. Oh, yeah. Our chapter fluctuates a lot. Um, here in Manhattan, we have such a transient population, as you know. Uh, we'll get some great guys on board. They'll be here for two or three years, and then, boom, they're gone, transferred. Either they're out of the military or out of town. Yeah. Same with the university. There's there's a lot of young kids here who, yeah, they were gung-ho when they started, and now they're working on a career somewhere, moving out of town. Um, we just It's tough to keep good committee members here. Um, that are that want to help and, and stay for the long term. Right. We'll get a year or two out of them, and pretty pretty soon we're we're down to a handful of of, of really good guys. I, I know I know DU um, recognizes people uh, as a committee member if they like sell one ticket besides their own, or they bring one volunteer mm-hmm. to the to the uh, next meeting, uh, a new, recruit a new member committee member. And that's all they ask, uh, which is, you would think, fairly simple. Yeah. But it's it's not. Uh, it takes it takes um, somebody who will go out and ask uh, somebody to buy a ticket and somebody to try to recruit a new member. And uh, if if all of our committee members did that every year, we'd be going like gangbusters. But um, right. It's it's uh, it fluctuates a lot, especially yeah. in this community. So where all has duck hunting taken you? Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about you hunting in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Uh, where else have you hunted? Um, some of the guys I've, well, who even 25 years ago, some friends of mine who who were on the committee then, who helped restart the committee, um, who I'm still really great friends with, we, we, uh, we take a trip every year to uh, northwest Saskatchewan and hunt. Primarily, we target snow geese, but we hunt waterfowl in general up there, and we've been doing that. I've actually done that, I think, like 17 out of the last 19 years. Oh, jeez. So just about as soon as I started duck hunting, within a few years, we started throwing together a a collection of decoys, and and they were junk in those days. I mean, we literally were taking trash bags and putting them on sticks sometimes. But um, we we shot geese and ducks. And uh, it's a fantastic place up there. It's it's um it's a whole different ball game, and uh, the people are fantastic, and and the opportunities the the uh, congregation of ducks and geese in that area. Um, those are the first fields in uh, in the uh, farming area where the birds come to, and they the the numbers of birds that you can see there in a in a day is phenomenal you you wouldn't believe how many birds are in that area and yeah. you'd think it was great hunting and it's not always uh, but um, it's a spectacle that's what I've always told everybody it's a spectacle to see that many birds concentrated on the ground or on the water in one area it's yes yeah. it's, it's 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 worth the trip just to see the site uh, yeah. if you're a waterfowl lover and so yeah, I've traveled all over, but uh, um, I really don't anymore hunt uh, much outside of northeast Kansas other than that trip to Saskatchewan yeah. every year. And we try to try to make that a ten, eight or ten day adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get out of town for a little bit. That's probably yeah. pretty nice. Pretty nice. So. But awesome. Um, so you do a lot of like small water and like, you do uh, ag fields too. Don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I I actually prefer late season to be hunting uh, in the field, um, even for ducks. Uh, it, it it's it's fun to watch the birds bomb into a feed field, and 
come come smoking in. Yeah, what kind of what kind of spread do you like? What do you do? You know, when you're hunting ducks in a field late season, like what's your technique, your go to? I like to set up enough uh, Canada decoys around myself that it looks like the like like the ducks are coming into a flock of honkers, and uh, and then a handful of um, maybe full body duck decoys and two or three spinning wing decoys maybe 20 yards uh, off to the side. Um, you I really, I really or... put yeah layout blind. Uh, I re- I really put the emphasis on the Canada geese. Uh, I think just like in the marsh, I think a good hide, uh, if you can if you can completely disappear, you can get those ducks to come right down on the deck and, and even land a lot of times. Uh, I see a lot of guys shooting ducks that are 40, 50, 60 yards high. And uh, if they're not finishing, they're, they're not finishing because they either see you or they, or they don't like something that's going on uh, in your spread that's... that's uh, that's turning them away. So the better you can hide, the the the, the more cover you can provide in a, even in a in a really low cut cornfield. Um, the the better the better your layout blind looks. The more geese you have around you, the closer the ducks are going to come in. Yeah. Give those shots that you're looking for. In those super low cut cornfields, like where we're talking, like three inches of stock. Mm-hmm. How do you, what's your like? How do you conceal the, your layouts? Uh, if they've cut it for silage, that's a tough field to hunt. Um, yeah. it, there isn't, uh, there isn't really much you can, you can't go out and rake up a pile of <laughs> right. stuff. I, and I steer away from those fields. A lot of times there aren't, there's not as much grain in there. Um, cause they've taken it, they've taken everything. Yeah. Um, makes it a lot tougher. That's why the, that's why the honker decoys are, and I pack them in tight. Um, the ducks, the ducks aren't really paying attention to Silhouettes, how full bodies. Full bodies Full usually, bodies, yeah. But I have some silhouettes, and silhouettes work good. Silhouettes work work really good. We used to use that's we didn't we bought silhouettes when we started, and used them for years with a lot of success. And yeah, and I don't know that you couldn't still do that. Obviously, yeah. you do that. And so you just you you basically just hide in the decoys. Yeah, I'm hiding in the in the in the Canada yeah. use decoys. Yeah. Um, I've actually even not used a layout blind. I just laid. In my camouflage between the goose decoys. Oh, okay. That works as well, if you can prop yourself up enough to get up. Yeah, out. sure. Get comfortable. Get, get up a shot. <laughs> get up to shoot. Uh, switching off the fields a little bit. Um, when you take your boat in up on the river or something like that, um, what kind of and you're talking about hides? You know, talking about seeing people shooting ducks 40, 50. I've been seeing a lot of 60 yard shooting mm-hmm. lately. Right. <laughs> up in that marsh that I was talking to you about. Right. Um, what do you what are you using to get them you know get them into ten fifteen there are you you setting up a blind on your boat or are you hiding in the the I rarely ever hunt out of my boat I'm I'm walking in like everybody else does but I'm trying to I'm trying to find a I'm trying to find a, a place that that I feel like the ducks want to be but primarily I'm first first and foremost looking for a place where I can hide um, and it doesn't really even I don't really focus on wind direction. I like to have uh, the sun behind me. I mean, if it's a sunny day, which is not what they always call a ducky day, is a rainy day. Right. I don't. I don't hunt in the rain. I I quit hunting in the rain when I was two years into this. Out of comfort. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, and it, I, just, I just don't feel like the ducks work in the rain. And I think the ducks can see better on cloudy days. Uh, they can pick you out a lot, lot, lot quicker. Yeah. And easier because there's no reflection and there's no shadow. And it's a lot like photography. Um, you know, if, if you have all that glare and all those shadows, it doesn't make for a great picture when you're looking into the sun. It's just, it's that you can't see well, and the ducks can't see well. So if you can set up on the, on the up sun side of the spread mm-hmm. uh, in the shadows and find enough cover, they'll land. I had a flock land. I, I had a flock of 60-plus birds land. All of them were going to land inside of 20 yards of me. And I was out in the marsh, and there wasn't a stick of anything around me other than <laughs> some clumps of some weeds. And I was on the upwind, upwind happened to be upwind, up sun side. Oh. And um, they had no idea I was there. Yeah. Do you ever hunt sandbars? Yeah. There? Oh, yeah. This year's tough. The lake's been crazy high. They've been dumping water <laughs> yeah. out of everywhere. And uh, that'll change the way the river 
flows when the water does come down and where the sandbars are. But yeah, I've, I've, I've hunted a lot of sandbars and it's the same thing there. I like it. Do you I think we'll this. have some sandbars come February time frame? Hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping so too. But so. I like to do the same thing out there. Set up a bunch of honkers around me yeah. and, uh, and then a few ducks in the water and, and get, get those ducks down low in the middle of the river and, and get them to feel confident that those candidates are there because it's safe. Right. So, yeah, that's, um, how does your call, I mean, how much calling do you do in, in your, you know, style of hunting? Um, I don't call a lot. I call sparingly and, um, uh, and, and as the season goes, I probably call less and that's, that's if I'm hunting by myself. It's hard to convince some guys to not over call. And uh, if you just listen to the ducks, um, they don't call all the time. Uh, I, I have a cabin on the lake up north, and the ducks hang out in the middle of Tuttle a lot late season. And uh, they're out there all afternoon. But they're not doing it continuously, and they're not they're not blowing a highball call out there. They're yeah. attracting other ducks and letting other ducks know they're there. And ducks find ducks because they can hear them, and uh, and see them, I suppose, to some degree. But when they're migrating at a high altitude, I think they can hear that call uh, from other ducks uh, rested on the water. And they're not down there blowing a, a highball, screaming right. call at each other. They're just they're just quacking their normal. I'm over here. You know, yeah. I'm still here. I'm. I don't really care if you come it, this way, right. but but there are I'm here. Some of us down here, and then they <laughs> kind of feed off of that. And and if you're doing it right, you can hear the ducks coming down, calling back to you. I've heard they a lot. They don't do that a I've lot. A, I've heard a lot more. Right. You know, in the air than I have. You know. Right. Anything this season, which. Yeah. They're not real vocal. They're not as vocal as people have you think they are or duck hunters think they are they they um guys tend to overcall in my opinion yeah most especially when there's bunches of guys in the market <laughs> sure sure uh so out of all the you know all the duck species to hunt what's are you always just going out for mallards unless it's teal season right uh primarily i um i like to shoot a limit of ducks a day that's that's what flips my switch and so I I would uh, if if this like late season like now I I'm I'm looking at a flock of ducks trying to find a sixth duck. I mean I can't shoot six mallards, I can only shoot five. And I'm I'm fairly certain of if there's ducks around I can kill five greenheads. But um, so I'm really looking to 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 find that other duck. Looking low to see where those pair right. of teal are that are still swinging around. Or uh, trying to pick out a pintail in a big flock and kill that bird first, so that I can kill a limit of ducks, not just five. I mean, right. I, I'm kind of keyed on six a day. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> sure. That's that's my goal. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so finding that other duck is is tough this time of year. Yeah. But uh, sure. I love the mallards. Yeah. I would. I would. If there weren't uh, mallards. Uh, in the numbers that there are this time of year in this part of the country, I, I would probably not be the duck hunter I am today, I suppose. I, I just love the way they decoy. They're, they're, uh, they're just a lot of fun. Yeah. Over the years, have you seen a, a change in your harvests um, around here, just specifically in this area? Or has it always been just thick with mallards? Um, it's always pretty consistent. Um, not always. They're not always in the same spot. Every, every year... Uh, things change, the habitat changes, the conditions change, the water levels change a lot at Tuttle Creek, especially. And, uh, it's been surprising what, what, uh, what brings ducks here. Like we had the flooding earlier this year. I really didn't expect to see, I was, I was looking at, at a really bad year because I expected Tuttle to be really dry yeah. after they held water for the construction project and then dumped water right before season and then we had that huge rain, and uh, the lake went up 30 feet. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. I wonder what this will do to the duck population. And I think every duck that migrated stopped here because there were ducks here, and there's water here. And uh, it was phenomenal. They, I mean, I think they reported thirty to 40,000 ducks when the season opened. And yeah. uh, 
Uh, I had some guys call me and go, there's no way, there's no way there's 30 or 40,000 ducks up there. And I said, way, there's at least 30 or 40,000 ducks up there and maybe yeah. more, probably more, at least initially. Right. They weren't exactly easy to hunt, but they were here in numbers like I hadn't seen in the 25 years I've been hunting. Oh, uh, really? Other than there was a there was a late season December rainstorm here, I don't know, five or six years ago, four or five years ago, and the lake came up big time, and it was amazing within a few days how many ducks all of a sudden came out of the woodwork and showed up on that on that flooded uh, area up yeah. there. What's the back. best year you can remember duck hunting wise? Hmm. I haven't looked at the dates in my journals in a long time, but um, there was a year probably 15, 12 or 15 years ago where I had a lot of time available to duck hunt, <laughs> and there were a lot of ducks here and on the river, and uh, I used to hunt the river a lot more than I do. Uh, access to the river has changed, and, and uh, people with uh, airboats and a lot of other boats have made the river not... I, I think the river isn't well it just there's been a lot of population growth in this area the river's not as productive or as good, or as much of a holding spot as it was for birds uh 10 15 20 years ago so i don't hunt it as much that and, the, and like i said the flooding right now is killing it so yeah um anyway uh the year i had in mind there i i shot ducks and limits of ducks. It seemed like every time I went out, it was crazy the numbers I stacked up that year. <laughs> and the more limits that you get, the more you go out. <laughs> uh, it's addictive. It's a very addictive sport. It really is. You know, you're talking about that rain. Uh, was it? I think it was maybe a week ago. Mm -hmm. Was that when we had that big rain or that cold rain? I should say. Yeah. Um, Last week. And I remember my wife just kept like looking over at me on the couch because I'm on vacation. She kept like looking over at me like, finally, you know, around. Noon, she goes, are you really not going duck hunting today? <laughs> and I said, no, it's it's too rainy. And she said, yeah, I couldn't keep you in the house it, with any, you know, slight amount of weather. And I, I think something, you know, a difference between where I've been hunting and, and here, there was, I, I just been finding a lot more success on a little bit sunnier days mm -hmm. uh, um, and just wind. Right. So. Right. Both of those play, I think, a big role. I like I said, I don't not dunk duck hunt on rainy days because I don't like getting wet, and I don't. But um, it it just isn't as productive, in my opinion. It's harder to hide. It's harder to, and I don't think the ducks move as much. I don't think they, I don't like the rain as much either. Yeah, yeah. So um, around here, um, have we seen any sort of you know what kind of conservation efforts have we seen in like the last five ten years um, around Tuttle that you know of? Or what you know? If you someone gave you a blank check for a billion bucks, you know what would you do around here for ducks? <laughs> Tuttle, Tuttle. I know the. I'm gonna call them old guys. I'm an old guy too, but the the guys that I've known since I started duck hunting, who are now really old guys, um, talked about how great it was, you know, back in the '70s and 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 in, in those days at at Tuttle Creek. And I'm sure it. I'm sure it just the same way when it flooded. And the habitat conditions are right. The ducks came, just like they do everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've since built some marshes, and the flooding up at the north end continues to erode those areas. And I, I, uh, with my involvement in DU, I'm pretty in tune with the projects that are going on in Kansas, mm -hmm. and we try to promote that in our newsletter. And uh, we email that out to everybody. Hopefully, everybody reads it. But I know a lot of people don't. But that's a good source of information as far as what is going to happen, not, not only what's happening or what they have done, but what is going to happen. And uh, I know currently there's a, a big push to continue to put money into Cheyenne Bottoms. So there, there was a huge uh, grant, I think, just recently that's going to continue the, the uh, restoration of that wetland. But uh, the biologists that, that we have, in this region are out of uh, Nebraska, and uh, they're looking to put some money in, I think, into uh, Tuttle again in the near future. So there's, awesome. that's, uh, that would be fantastic. I mean, it's, it's, there's so much space there. Um, it, it, it could accommodate a lot of 
of uh, uh, habitat restoration. Uh, unfortunately, when we get 30 feet of water in there. Yeah, it's uh, a little tough to hunt this that year. That makes it tough to hunt, and that <laughs> makes it tough to manage that when, it, when it's underwater and when, yeah. it's, when it's eroded. Yeah, so I know that they said this year was like, like a perfect year um, for Cheyenne Bottoms because they got to take out a bunch of reeds, mm -hmm. and then right when they needed the water, it, it showed just, up. It came, yeah. They had, <laughs> they had a drought all summer like the rest of us, and they were able to work in there really heavily on those cattails and all the issues they have down there and uh then the water came they were holding some water trying to hoping that they could flood some of those marshes and then the big rains came and they didn't have to use any of their water I don't yeah think. and the birds came with it oh yeah absolutely absolutely uh so you got any you you gonna be goose hunting around here pretty soon yeah i haven't shot a goose yet this year which is uh kind of atypical i guess for the year but uh uh, ducks close right now, so it's time to focus on the big honkers and find yeah. out where they're going. I heard them flying over this morning when I was changing my oil. So Today's the last day for ducks, isn't it? I think it was yesterday. Was it wasn't yesterday? I think it was Sunday. Well, good thing I didn't go out today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Um, so, I was, when I was taking my daughter to daycare, I saw five or six groups putting down in, in some of your yeah. fields there. And, um, and uh, yeah, the Annenberg Park geese, they were mm -hmm. out flying around so uh -huh. and i think we picked up geese with that front we had come through last weekend yeah uh when i was up at the lake uh saturday and well friday and saturday there were definitely birds migrating uh canada's flying south at really high altitudes yeah which told me that they were getting snow up north and the wind was right and they'd had enough of the cold they were moving south so hopefully we'll pick up some ducks and geese now i wanted to just close out this interview with um how we can be, you know, maybe, you know, you're in Ducks, you're a Ducks Unlimited member, um, and you pay your, your 35 bucks, uh, this is what it is, 35 bucks uh, per year, and, uh, you know, what can you do to be a better member? Just <laughs> without, you know, going out and being a volunteer, like really getting, like, you know, biting off the, the DU piece of pie, what can you do to be a better member, you know, to help your chairman out or your, your volunteers out? Um I think really what it boils down to is uh, 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 selling tickets to the event. Uh, get, getting fill in the hall is what uh, what uh, our our uh, goal is in the state is to not just have an event and and buy cool stuff gun, and sell give away guns or right. uh, raffle guns. Um, the goal is to fill fill the hall, and that that's exactly the quote um, the regional directors will use. Um, it doesn't matter how much stuff you have or, or um, how, how, what kind of stuff you have. It, 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 it has to all sell for a profit, and, uh, and your net needs to be 60% or greater for the ducks to be making some money. And uh, it's, the goal is to double or triple your, your values on things. And you can't do that unless you have people in the, in the room. And it doesn't really matter. It, it does matter to a certain extent which people you have in the room, but... It, if you have if a, if you have a sold out event, that makes all the difference in the world. And the only way to sell out an event effectively is face to face um, contact and and asking somebody person to person to buy a ticket or to support DU. Even if they don't show up, just buy a ticket. Yeah. Or uh, you know become a member, which you're you're going to become a member if you buy a ticket. Right. So that that gets that gets your information into the computer at DU National where all the funds go, and, and they decide where to spend them. Um, and, and that captures your information, and they can, they can count not only on your money, they can count on you, count on being able to contact you for future events, and they can use your information to sell their publications, advertising in their publications, because they have that many more people um, in their membership list. So that membership is means something. It... it, it it drives the organization and it pays the bills. Yeah. So the, 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 everybody knows a handful of people who they think might be interested in a ticket, but, uh, there's, there's some overlap there, but if you can, the more committee members you can have, the more tickets you can sell, the more people you can have in your event, the more success the event will be. And, and the more successful ducks unlimited will be. And then the more ducks we will have because yeah. the habitat on the ground is really where it comes from. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. I really enjoyed this talk, and uh, we'll, be, 
be having you on soon. I think we'll probably get on a goose hunt here in February and we'll do something from the blind. Sounds good. <laughs>
Um, and so, awesome, awesome. And uh, if anybody's raised, like, kind of raising their eyebrows, the you got the lawyers. They've already checked all this stuff out. Um, yeah, we uh, we've got uh, Sewell and Giles is our uh, is a, a sponsor of our uh, has been a sponsor of our banquet for the last couple of years. And uh, in looking into this idea. I was struggling to, to find some information because I didn't want to be stepping into any, you know, hot water or gray areas. Um, so I called them up and they, they looked into the, the gaming laws and they talked with the officials in Topeka. Um, it gave us the go ahead. Um, basically ran down the, the points of, you know, possible contention. Told us where we needed to steer clear. We, we, uh, you know, kind of molded our rules around those guidelines, mm -hmm. and uh, they backed us 100%. Um, we talked with uh, local wildlife and parks um, to get their thoughts and opinions on it. We talked to the, the federal uh, warden, and uh, they all kind of gave us the go-ahead. And so with their, with their blessing and their, uh, their backing, it's game on. Game on. All right, so what are the prizes? So we have uh, uh, Cabela's is donated. We've got um, lots of lots of ground blinds. We've got several layout blinds. Um, we're going to have probably upwards of 10 dozen decoys um, to give out full body decoys, the bags to house them. Um, we'll have Mallard Machine Ice Eaters or... Uh, we could use those in Kansas right about now, but well, I guess it's, yeah. it's it's heating up a little. bit. Last week it was a little rough, but yeah. yeah, we'll have we'll have decoys, blind bags. We'll have we'll have uh, lacrosse boots. We'll have basically we're gonna have upwards of ten thousand dollars worth of gear available to the top five teams um, for them to win. Top prizes, you know, thirty five hundred dollars in gear. So that's not too bad. Alex over here salivating, figuring out, <laughs> scheming, scheming, but, but yeah, this is gonna be a good time. Um, I'm I'm super excited. I'm gonna I'm gonna be at the 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 way in. You're not coming little... to the banquet? Oh, I'm coming to the banquet. Oh, I was gonna say no. Your money spends just as good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be I'll be there. I'm even gonna drag my wife and kid along. Oh, so you are. You didn't tell a, me that. Yet. We're gonna we're gonna make a whole like uh, weekend out of it. So fair enough. Fair enough. But. Yeah, I don't know. That might have been a step too far. I don't know if my my wife's probably gonna listen to this and be like, eh, "I don't think so." <laughs> I, I'm gonna go shopping that weekend, but um, but no, yeah, uh, heading up to the uh, the banquet. That'll be fun. Um, probably get a hotel room there or or something. Um, but and then the next morning, probably go check in on a couple crews out in the field, do some some field reporting. Man, you got. Well, hopefully, we got some friendly friendly hunters willing to willing to. Share their spots. Oh, wow! You know this is that's a, true. Duck hunters is a, it's like a brotherhood of secrecy. That's true. Uh, I'll just make sure I turn my all my location sharing uh, <laughs> off. Maybe uh, we'll do call-ins from the field. Yeah, maybe do call-ins or I'll, or I'll bribe someone. Who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see. But um, yeah, and then do the weigh-ins at uh, what is it? You said two start mm -hmm. starts at two p.m. Right? Yep. What's uh, the deadline? Uh, I believe it's two fifteen. I'd have to check the rules, but okay. basically we want we want people to be punctual. We feel like we've given, uh, you know, ample time to get there. Uh, be punctual, and uh, uh, there's there's penalties if you're late. Um, it's a pound if you're if you're late a minute to check in, a minute to five minutes. It's a pound. Um, five to ten minutes late. It's two pounds. Right. 10 to 15, it's 3, and if you're after 15, it's DQ. DQ. So. Yeah. It pays to be punctual. That's right. That's right. But Better to show up with what you got than uh, yeah. to show up too You'd late. You'd really be kicking yourself if you showed up like three minutes late and you, you lost out on placing because <laughs> of a penalty. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. And uh, where did you say they could uh, sign up for this event? Uh, the best way to do it, you can... Uh, go to go to Facebook, um, look up our chapter at Second Split Delta Waterfowl. Uh, go to our events, and then uh, 
You can click on uh, click on the the 2019 Goose Games by Cabela's and uh, the inaugural Goose the Games. inaugural Goose Games. You're right. You're right. I Use forgot the, uh, that the the fancy four dollar <laughs> word right there. Oh yeah, yeah. But, I went to college. <laughs> I didn't graduate, but I went. <laughs> I went as a communication studies major, so you well, know, I didn't learn. Since you have a podcast, huh? Putting to, putting your education to yeah. I, interestingly enough, I guess so. <laughs> so that yeah. wasn't the intent. The intent was just to get through college, and that was one of the easier degrees. So, well, at least you're honest. Yeah, that's true. But okay, anyway, so yeah, go sign up for that. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, definitely, this is. I think this is like a one of a kind thing, and I'm just. Happy to be around it, so. Yeah, I, this is, uh, I haven't heard of anything quite like this. There's uh, there's only one, I mean, I, I searched this all over. I've never seen anything quite like it. They, they got one up, and I think it's either Wyoming or Montana. It's the it's the two-shot um, tournament up there. Each each participant gets two shots, and uh, if, you, if you don't bag your four birds, you basically can't win. Oh wow! Yeah, and they they, it's a cool deal. Look that up. I think I've seen that. Before. Uh, look it up. It was featured on I think uh, an episode of I think Heartland Waterfowl. Okay. I think. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, good deal. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna pack it in. I think for the, at least put away the recorder for a little bit, yeah. and then um, we do have an early morning. Yeah. What time are we getting out there? Well. We're hunting with those dive bombs, so... Uh, yeah, that's true. So we're, we're going to get to sleep in a little more than I did this yeah. morning. What's the total... <laughs> what, what's our total count out that we got out in the truck? We got dive bombs just pouring out of Probably our truck. 40 dozen. 50, yeah, close 45 dozen, I think. So... I'm excited. I, I, I've hunted a few dive bombs um, so far. Most I've hunted over is 10 dozen. Uh, but I'm excited to you see. Know, we got nine guys coming out, so that, that spread's going to go up pretty quick. I'm figuring we can probably put it... Put it out in maybe 10, 10 minutes. <laughs> we'll time ourselves. 15, 15 tops. How's the, uh, what's the walk-in look like? Uh, it's, it's basically non-existent. <laughs> a man after my own these, heart. Uh, the, these birds, they've been coming off this big watershed uh, to the east and south of us. And they're just basically flying up over the highway and dumping into this field. And then tonight scouting, these birds were... You know, forty yards off the gravel road, um, and then maybe five to eight yards off the fence line. Oh, and so, uh, I just think it's gonna be. I just think it's gonna be a massacre in the morning. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's what we're all shooting for. But yeah, uh, I'm pretty excited about the hunt. I'm glad we got lots of guys, and I'm I'm looking forward to hunting over an all silo spread. It'll be a new one for us. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be, I think it's going to be fun. So I'm just, you got a nice little cabin down here. This is nice. Yeah, I mean, I I put a lot of time into this cabin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Getting it ready for, for clients this year. And yeah. This is your guys' first uh, year running clients, right? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we uh, we got into it this year. Uh, it was kind of funny how it all got going. Uh, Dustin and I, we were just hanging out, working on stuff for the upcoming season back in I guess it had been like probably June, mm-hmm. July, and uh, I just picked up access to a, a bunch of new ground, and he just picked up access to a bunch of new ground. He's like, man, there's no way we're going to be able to just hunt this all to ourselves. And uh, on a whim, I was like, we ought to just start a guide service. And he's like, he was, he, he just kind of went over, but then two days later, he calls me up, and he goes, were you serious about that? And I go... I'm serious if you're serious, and uh, that's how it all got started, and uh, then we started pouring ourselves into this cabin and getting it ready for guys, and you know, yeah, it, it, that's how it, that's how it started, and it's it's you know it's kind of developed its own legs and it's taken off and ran, and it's excited. I'm. How'd you come up with the name Sky Panda? You know, I social media. Uh, I, I saw it for the first time and I thought, damn, that's funny. Because yeah, they look like yeah. I mean, I, I thought it. I thought it was clever and funny, and it just stuck. And then when it comes time to come up with a name, um, and we we shoot mostly big honkers, it was like, 
that's kind of perfect and that's it kind of right. it offers it basically brands yourself yeah as a as a goose shooting outfit and uh whenever people say man i'd really love to shoot some geese um they look for sky yeah. panda <laughs> what's the uh what's the transition like um on the home front when you're like walk home after a conversation with your hunting buddy and you're like hey babe i think we're gonna start a a hunting outfit she was down Oh, there you go. She was down. Uh, like if, you know, growing up, they always tell you if you can turn what you love to do into, you know, if you can profit off of what you love to do, you should do that. Right. And so there's there are a few things I'm more passionate about in life than waterfowl hunting. And uh, it's just been... Yeah. It's She's, hard to make money off being a dad, right? Well, <laughs> you can be really good at it. But uh yeah, I mean running the running the other small business, my my nine to five and this, I mean but yeah, she was all on board. Um but you you really don't realize what you're what you're stepping into until you step into it. Um you're you're working way harder than you did for yourself. Mm. Um, trying to put guys on memorable moments. Your your end game is to build relationships with these guys that you you know you want these guys to to take away memories they're going to be talking about the rest of their life. Right. And to do that, you got to work hard. You got to spend all kinds of time scouting, sacrifice some time with your family. Um, that's been the biggest adjustment for the the wife and the kids. Um, yeah. When it's time to hunt, it's not just. It's not just I'm hunting for fun anymore. It's right. You know, I'm, there's pressure. Yeah. So that's. But when it after after you've had a successful hunt and the guys are smiling and you know and then they said, "Man, that was an awesome time," and you really know you've done it whenever they they rebook and that's a good feeling. Yeah. All that work paid off and it's just a it's a damn good feeling. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but well, I'm looking forward to it. So, what's our, you never answered the question. That was a long was roundabout long time. Uh, well, what time am I waking up? You know, we're just we're we're only about five miles from where we're going, okay. so uh, we're gonna wake up four forty five, five o'clock, roll out of here, get there about five thirty, and uh, blinds are already brushed. Your blinds are brushed. Hundred uh, brushed. Oh, damn it. Well, that's, that's so typical. Such a rookie move. You know what, Ben? You're gonna be you're gonna be sitting there holding your recording device, asking Alec, "Hey, would you brush that in? I didn't leave my I left my gloves in the truck." Well, you know, funny thing is, is every time I hunt with Alec, he always is asking me for gloves. He like, thinks I'm a glove vendor or something. I got one. I had to do that this morning. I went to go grab my gloves out of my my truck toolbox, and I only had one right hand glove. Like, what what happened to my what yeah. happened to the left? I swear, it's like losing socks in the laundry. I, I oh, yeah. have like some nice merino wool socks, and I can only find one of those socks at a time. And they're labeled left, right? And I'll, I'll one hunt, I'll have the left sock. I'm like, okay, good. I found the left one. Make sure I put that one in. Okay. That, then the next time I'm out, I'm like, where's the damn sock? I can only find one. And I'll look, and it's the right one. And so I can't like keep track. They're like $30 socks. So I don't know what's going on there. But, Man. yeah. You live a good life wearing $30 socks. Well, yeah. I buy mine in a 12-pack for my, like six bucks. My feet and hands get <laughs> yeah. so cold. So cold. I'm just a, I'm a Man, salad. I gave up on wearing gloves. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even like shooting with them, so I just had to... My hands are all cracked because I don't wear gloves. Yeah. Like ever. What is it about the water up here? I never had this issue down in New Mexico or Oklahoma. S- I stick my hand in any sort of water, and my hands are just dried out and cracked. I think it's the yeah. soil. I don't know if it's, I mean, the water too, but I think it's the soil. Like, my, like my, my fingers were peeling. Like, oh, you got yeah. them office kind of hands. I did, I, you know, like the office, I'm not a, not a blue-collar <laughs> guy. I, I just sit here, and I, you know, I record the podcast, and I type on my computer all day. And apply lotion. <laughs> lotion is essential to having excellent keyboarding fingers. You can't have your, you know, your digits all cracking up on the keyboard, you know? I guess. So in the morning, I'll, I'll supervise, I'll hold the light. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. 
It sounds like I'll be brushing my blind. Yeah. Is there anything to brush out there with? I mean, it looks all right. Yeah, there's we'll, there's there's a, a large couple large grass points. We'll, we'll okay. cut from one grass point and hunt the other. And, uh, I knew I was getting to that. Have you cussed on your own podcast? Oh, well, I you know, I'll, just, it. I'll mark that. <laughs> <laughs> you can throw one or two curse words out there. It's a relatively family friendly <laughs> podcast. Yeah, but. Or I'll just bleep it or something. I don't know. Actually, I've been in the. You, you're around me for twenty minutes, and you're you're spitting already. out four letter <laughs> words on your podcast. <laughs> I've been listening for what? How many episodes you up to now? Oh, uh, I think I, I don't think I've heard a single. So uh, interestingly enough, I don't know what um, pot episode number I'm on because iTunes sent out this email. They're like, oh hey, you can't have. You know, episode number 24, whatever. Like, whatever the episode of it is. Like, they don't let you... Like, they said that that's grounds for, like, getting kicked off iTunes. So, now I don't even know. I think it's, like, 50, maybe? Really? I'll have to go back and count. the first time I was on your podcast. Yeah, when was that? Uh, like, between 19 and 20, I was one of those... uh, Yeah. The Solo Hunter one. Check it out. Yeah, The Solo Hunter with Chad Dawson. Yeah. That was a good one. I remember that. We talked for, like, two hours. Yeah, those were those podcasts were supposed to be those episodes were supposed to be like thirty minutes long. <laughs> well, and we next, had a good talk. Yeah, it was. It was. It was I mean, true. it covered everything. Yeah, absolutely. It covered being a dad and a hunter, and yep, all that solo stuff. hunting and mm-hmm. all, all the not so solo anymore. Yeah, you know it's funny the evolution because we had that conversation before the season. Yeah, and uh, you know, just proof that it, anything can change. It, it was wild. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. I was just thinking about that the other day. Yeah, you have to go check that out after you guys listen to this this episode. So I think it was right there after what Megan was talking about her photograph. Her yeah, photo and yep. stuff. I think so. Somewhere around there, like nineteen. Yeah, nineteen. Nineteen twenty something yeah. like that. You know, after we get, up, I'm gonna have to count all the episodes and see what episode I'm on. I guess I just like kind of like stop getting even on the uh, like. Where the little when I submit my episode thing, it makes me say what season is this and what episode number it is. On there, I'm like, oh, I can't remember the last one, so I just been like, uh, episode two hundred. I don't know, like, just go in incremental order. Just so. forget that way you don't got to do a big giveaway. Yeah, if I yeah exactly, <laughs> not a lot to give away these days. So, but all right, so we're gonna be hunting over forty five dozen, or well, we'll figure it out in the morning. Yeah. I don't know necessarily how much it is. Plenty. And a Chevy have Silverado. Hunted, have you guys hunted over this this many no. together? We have like thirty. That me and my buddies. Yeah. Use. So Alex got thirty. I've got twenty. And so I I hunted over all twenty of them last weekend just I to see do. what it. Oh no! There's no birds in Manhattan right now. Like oh, well, come on. Alex found them. Come on. I busted ice for like mm, an hour and a half because I took this little gal out. Uh, she's my like. She's my soon-to-be sister-in-law or something, a co-sister-in-law. And what is a co-sister-in-law? Uh, it's like when you're not... like. Is it like the significant girlfriend of a sibling? No, so like my sister-in-law right now, so my wife's sister, she's engaged to this guy, and that guy is this gal's brother. You gotta, you need a I'm not card. wrapping my brown mind around that too good because yeah, it's late, <laughs> but that sounded like some Arkansas stuff. <laughs> well, at any rate, yeah, I got skunked, but um, it was... Man, I can't believe a nationally broadcast podcaster still has skunk days. Oh, I get skunked a lot. <laughs> it's amazing they even let me have a podcast. It is funny. Yeah. I, 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 I do think it's funny, like... like I don't think people realize that hunting is still hunting. It's whether you're, whether you're a you know podcaster, or you're a guide, or whatever. Yeah. There's always tough days. And like I always say, remember, like I should just put this in my intro, like, like a disclaimer. I am not like a bad. I almost said I'm not a bad hunter. <laughs> like um, three letter word. Yeah, yeah. I marked it, so we're good. Um, I'm not like a professional expert hunter. Um, it's just that I've learned a lot of lessons that new people learned just a very short time ago, you know, five years. It's my sixth season. 
seriously waterfowl hunting. Yeah, this was seven for me. Yeah, so I'm trying to like help bridge the gap there. So. Yeah. But yeah. Well, all right. I think we're gonna put a. We should do. We'll do some. We'll do some recording tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay. So. After you brush your blind in. After Alec brushes my blind. Yeah. <laughs> after you brush. Your hey, blind. I pay. I pay for gap. No, just yeah. yeah. I'll brush my. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Fowl Front Waterfowl Podcast. Please come join us on our Facebook group, the Fowl Front Waterfowl Podcast group, where you can connect with a good group of hunters because we're all in this together. We need to act like it so that hopefully our great, great grandkids will be hunting ducks over our favorite public lands. Uh, We also ask that you go ahead and give us a written review on iTunes and give us five stars if you think we deserve it. And we really do want to hear back from you uh, so that we can give you the best possible content. And if you get in on that Facebook group, you can get in there and you can ask questions and you can tell us what you want to hear next or you can tell us uh, what you don't like. And we'll be sure to tailor things to our listeners. So, all right. Stay safe out there and we will see you next week.